Well, I think we're ready now to start the uh, session proper. And of course, I would like to start by acknowledging the, the traditional owners for the lands where I am uh, sitting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, I'm here in the east of Melbourne. Um, and I pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I extend my respect to all of the, the elders of the lands where people are, are joining us today. Uh, so today we are talking about a really fascinating um, and emerging topic. So uh, most people will be aware that museums are controversial places for many Indigenous peoples around the world that they are sites where uh, colonial history and colonial collecting um, are on uh, full display, both sometimes literally, but also um, metaphorically, that, that Western nations and, and colonizing nations um, in the lands of indigenous people often have collected um, human remains from their, their people, uh, important cultural objects and really stolen them and, and kept them as um, as uh, objects of of empire. So we probably everyone here knows that in the last number of decades, really since the the eighties in in um, uh, since the eighties in um, in earnest, uh, indigenous peoples around the world have have um, have uh, demanded the return of human remains and cultural objects and we have repatriation legislation and policies all around the world. So what uh, the work of Tiffany and Shino, who we, what we're going to hear about today, is really taking all of that um, work in a new direction. Um, it has happened in other places in the world, but it is just an, a really emerging, an emerging issue appropriate for this Emerging Issues in Science and Society Symposium. So um, I'll, I'll introduce Tiffany and Shino now and they will give um, presentations and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So Tiffany will um, present first of all. Uh, Tiffany Shellen is an Associate Professor in History at Deakin University and she works collaboratively with Noongar people and histories, with museum curators, curators archivists and librarians to critique the archives, unearthing hidden and alternate histories generated by encounters between Indigenous people and European explorers and settlers in the early 19th century, particularly. And following uh, Tiffany, we will hear from Shino Kanishi, who is a Yawaru historian and an associate professor in the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at the Australian Catholic University here in Melbourne. Her research includes studies on Aboriginal intermediaries who played significant roles in European exploratory expeditions, including wayfinding and natural history collecting. And she currently leads an ARC project on Indigenous biography. So we are uh, extremely lucky to be able to hear from Tiffany and Chino. And um, Tiffany, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Emma. Just going to share my slides. Uh, hope you can all see those. Uh, and I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people on whose country I'm speaking from today and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Manang Noongar people um, from whose country the collections we're talking about today um, originate from. And thank you so much for this uh, uh, possibility to, to talk with you guys today and to share our, our exciting new project. It's a real honour. So in a recent, um, oh, I'm just going to put the Manang Noongar country up there. You can see I'm talking about the very southwest corner of Australia. In a recent paper published in the Journal of Natural Sciences Collection, authors Miranda Lowe, curator in life sciences at the Natural History Museum, and Sabadra Duff from University College London, quoted a tweet by Danny Birchall, digital manager at the Wellcome Collection, which stated, natural history museums are more racist than anyone will admit. 
Lo and Das found this statement affirming of their own experiences as curators of colour in natural science museums. Lo works on the collections of Hans Sloan, an extensive collection inextricably and until recently in denial of its link to the slave trade. Lo stated, natural history museums have to accept that we profited off the back of slavery. Over the last couple of decades, scholarship on historical ethnographic collections in history museums has grown into an exciting field of research, revising old claims of imperial scientific purposes of collecting to reveal fresh insights and post-colonial understandings of collecting histories. Museums and Indigenous communities have responded to and engaged with this scholarship, further influencing historians' approaches uh, to such collections. However, science and natural history museums have been much slower to acknowledge and respond to post-colonial critiques. Most have until very recently viewed their collections as unrelated to such histories and legacies. Narratives about the history of collecting, the preparatory practices to which specimens have been subjected to in the field and display in the museum are commonly absent from the interpretation of natural history collections where objects are often displayed as of nature and framed within a narrative of Western scientific endeavours uh, and rationality. Histories of Indigenous involvement, cultural practices and knowledge within and of natural history collections is only beginning to be identified. I must say I have noticed, uh, I guess in the last 18 months or 12 months or so, perhaps um, being at home and more glued to Twitter, um, I've really noticed the um, influences of the Black Lives Movement and um, on these kinds of approach and, you know, the removal of statues uh, of, of key figures in Europe, perhaps also lending itself to looking at other kinds of collections and museums as well, and the kind of hidden um, imperial histories behind them. Natural history collections have been complicated, I think, in good ways by the focus on biocultural collections. Biocultural collections are not a new phenomena, but they are shedding light on the perhaps limited scope in which uh, natural science collections are framed. They've been, biocultural collections have been defined as ethnobiological specimens, artefacts and documents, plant, animal and cultural, that represent dynamic relationships among people's biota and environments. They are repositories for plants and animals used by people, products made from them and or information and archives about them. They include uh, any object made from plant and or animal material, and especially those with a specific cultural connotation or use. They include herbarium and zoological specimens with label information on use, preparation, uh, common name or other cultural and linguistic information, ethnographic materials and cultural artifacts and biocultural documentation, such as libraries and archives, and that includes cultural texts, research field notes, maps, audio and linguistic collections, and any illustrative material that depicts uh, the products, such as sketches. And at Kew's Economic Botany Collection, the director Mark Nesbitt is acutely aware of the value of such culturally rich collections and the histories behind them. However, as biocultural collections are so diverse, he argues that there are difficulties in curating, databasing and accessing these materials. He suggests um, biocultural collections can be used in a variety of ways for scientific and applied research, species conservation, natural resource management and preservation and restitution of traditional knowledge. Natural history collections, when examined as part of their imperial history, I think can be used in similar ways to these biocultural collections. While I shy away from the term decolonizing, such a hot and in many ways quite useless word in the museum context, I think, um, the work here has perhaps uh, a decolonial intention. Working on a historical uh, geographical collection in, at London's Natural History Museum in 2017, my colleagues and I realized that one of the rocks collected in Australia's Northwest in 1818 was in fact a core artifact. The specimen bears concave scars that were formed when flakes were struck off, struck off it by Badi Jawi people, whose country includes Port Cunningham and the Dampier Peninsula. The label written by the collector states that it was found near the fireplaces of which the natives make hatchets. 
I drew this to the attention of the geology curator, an Italian marble specialist, who responded in a dismissive and surprisingly nervous way. When I met with him a year later, he told me that I had brought the core artifact to his attention and he had contacted the NHM lawyer that evening. While this might seem like an extreme example, it revealed to me that unlike history museums such as the British Museum, which is used to dealing with colonial histories and, and community claims, natural history institutions are not as well versed in these issues and perhaps in some cases don't necessarily know that they need to be. In the museum on the databases and catalogues, geological, botanical and zoological artefacts collected on the edges of empire, often with significant Indigenous involvement, are divorced from the colonial historical context which generated their acquisition and the Indigenous communities whose knowledge such collections sometimes capture. This plant was collected by Georgiana Malloy on Wadandi country in Augusta in, 18, in the 1830s. Perhaps Calgan, Bunny or Woden were dandy cultural uh, informants collected this with her or on her behalf and told her of its Wadandi significance, which was recorded by her, uh, but misinterpreted by later Q scientists. So it's clear that natural history museums played a role in colonialism and might be seen as continuing that logic today in their lack of acknowledgement of this history. As Miranda Lowe and Sabadra Das note, museums were integral to entrenching scientifically racist ideas, functioning as repositories for the objects and specimens collected on scientific expeditions carried out around the globe, and simultaneously legitimizing this collecting in the context of scientific thought. There is a growing tension, however, between the entangled yet unacknowledged imperial histories of natural history museums and the museum epistemologies which render this imperial history invisible. So we need to highlight imperial histories before they are destabilized. And uh, these tensions are really central to our new project, Entangled Knowledges, Cartagen, Science and History in the Robert Neal Collection. And Cartagen means knowledge in Noongar language. So what is this collection? Well, in 2018, I was on study leave at the British Museum researching collections from Western Australia. And I knew Robert Neal, a Scottish born commissariat officer, had made a portfolio of sketches in Albany in the early 1840s, which had Manang Noongar names for fish on the sketches. This portfolio I knew was held in the Natural History Museum in London, where a letter with manuscript notes about the fish is also kept. When I viewed the manuscript notes and the sketches up close, I noticed that fish scales were glued onto some of the sketches and often onto the notes too. I wondered, did Neil also preserve the fish? If he's preserved the scales and the sketches, he may have also collected fish. Perhaps some fish were sent to his hometown in Edinburgh. When I spoke to the National Museum of Scotland, their database showed two dried specimens from Neil, and they said they would do some further digging for me. I caught the train straight to Edinburgh, and when I got to the zoological storeroom, the curator and I couldn't believe the extent of their collection. There were 27 boxes containing dried fish specimens, some of which look like this. On further inquiry, the curator located three marsupials um, and one reptile skin and a crustacean. And most of these specimens, as you can see, were matched to the sketches uh, and archival material at the Natural History Museum. So I pushed further and in the Department of World Cultures in the National Museum of Scotland, uh, there are Manang, Manang ethnographic objects, including uh, beautiful emu feathered ornaments, boomerangs, throwing sticks, all collected by Neil in the 1840s in Albany. But in no way were these collections linked through museum databases um, to the zoological specimens or the portfolio of sketches in London. And the curators did not call their lawyers, but instead were keen to engage. So these fish were collected and preserved, but not caught by Robert Neal. Several of the fish were caught by Manang Noongar men, and their spear holes are evident on some of the specimens. In the commissariat, Neil was in charge of the colonial food supply 
and he issued daily rations to the men whom he came to know through fishing, talking, and working with them. Manari men and women took a key role in the process of catching, preserving, and describing the fish to Neil. They told him about the fish, the fish habitats and habits, whether they were good eating, how they were valued by their countrymen and women, and any spiritual or cultural ideas they attached to the fish. And this information was written down by Neil. When Neil began collecting the fish in 1841, in his letters he modestly suggests that this collection began because, and I quote, now and then a leisure moment was afforded from official duties and he thought it, was, it would be useful as well as amusing to collect and make drawings of the fish about King George's Sound. In truth, he was a keen amateur natural historian and had a famous naturalist cousin in Edinburgh, Patrick Neal. He was also inspired by visiting explorer collectors who came through Albany making similar collections, though without the Indigenous knowledge included, such as Edward Eyre, George Grey, John Gilbert, and um, the officers of the Beagle Voyage. Neil's idea behind uh, drawing the fish, which he did in the evenings, uh, directly following the catch, was to preserve their colour before they faded. In 1845, the fish collection was sent to the British Museum, now the Natural History Museum, where some of the collection was split up. Ichthyologist and explorer John Richardson, who was based at the Royal Navy's Haslar Hospital, made scientific assessments of the fish based solely on these sketches while the skins went to Edinburgh. And you can see his additions in the middle of this sketch here at the bottom in different writing to the others. Richardson retained the uh, Menang taxonomy for just one of Neil's fish, the Parrell, a rare inclusion of an Aboriginal name at this time. Taxonomy was a key aspect of Enlightenment science, particularly when it came to the natural world, ignoring existing names and identification by Indigenous groups. So as I said today, the collection is disconnected within the individual institutions themselves. Uh, this disciplinary and institutional dislocation of artefacts of Neil's original compilation is a legacy of Eurocentric imperial collecting and museum cataloguing practices, con uh, continuing, to, con continuing to fragment rather than preserve the relationships between the natural world, tangible objects and intangible cultural knowledge. The Manang names for the fish uh, are recorded on the labels in the National Museum of Scotland and on sketches, as you can see here. Um, he also rec recorded on the sketches the divergent names given to the fish by Manang fishermen, Albany settlers and sealers. The sealers were themselves part of a mobile multicultural workforce operating with Indigenous Tasmanian women in the southern ocean frontier. Therefore, this collection most likely includes Indigenous Tasmanian fish knowledge as well. So given all of this, uh, this collection really could be regarded as a biocultural collection rather than a pure natural history collection. Once I realised the ways in which the collection retains Manang Nunga knowledge, I contacted the Manang families that I knew in Albany and we devised um, a collaborative project governed by the Albany Heritage Reference Group Aboriginal Corporation and an interdisciplinary team of Indigenous and non-Indigenous museum curators, ichthyologists and historians um, who are working together to unpack this collection. That's a pretty um, amazing team, I have to say. It's very exciting to work with these great people. Um, we were very lucky to have a Deakin University Science and Society Network Incubator Grant, which allowed us to meet on country in 2019. This grant really got the project off the ground. Um, we worked through copies of the digital collection, or dig digitised um, copies of the collection together. And the name elders in these meetings revealed uh, the descriptive naming practice applied to the fish in the collection. Uh, Elder Lynette Knapp um, explained, for example, and I have a permission to, to explain this story, the name of the fish Tabadak refers to the shape of the fish head, like a tarp, Manang name for a knife. Um, and other names reveal that even though Manang had never seen a particular fish before, they had a name for that fish, which often related to their material culture, and which they gave to Neil when he, when he collected it. And many fish were named in relation to the shape or effect of their weapons. 
So sitting together in Albany, we were all quite moved to realise the structure of this Menang descriptive taxonomy and how much Menang cultural experts continue to possess rich knowledge about these fish, their ecosystems, cultural associations with fish and fishing uh, and, and more uh, detail um, that we haven't even begun to explore yet. So we really saw the potential of working across knowledges as a process to destabilise the current frameworks of these so-called natural history collections. There are, of course, real tensions surrounding the realignment of nature and culture in the museum today, with risks of redeploying tropes of Indigenous people as of nature. So reframing this tension is a key part of our research design. And we ask, how can Indigenous knowledge read culture uh, natural science collections? So new work in this field in Australia and the Pacific has brought Indigenous communities into the museum as a way of melding Indigenous knowledge with Western science. And our project aims to do that too, uh, but to also bring the museum onto Menang Budja or country to take part in on-country field work to ensure curators in the UK understand and connect with the relationships between the collection and Menang country and the context in which the collection was made. So our team will spend uh, time with Manang, walking on their country, recording fishing and burly sites and stories, uh, researching fish trap stories at Oyster Harbour um, and Plasm Hall and other key locations on country. And it is really um, beautiful country to be on. The fish curators will conduct marine field work with the Manang to catch um, voucher specimens of the fish, um, focusing on the parallel species um, whose Manang name was retained in the scientific taxonomic process in 1845. Uh, and I guess guided by the interests of the Menang families, we will work to firstly undertake research to make visible the entanglement of knowledges within the Neil collection. So really um, drawing out the enlightenment science, the indigenous knowledge and colonial histories before we begin to adjust that framework uh, by prioritizing Menang, Cartagen, and contemporary science and revisionist and custodial historical approaches. And one focus um, will be uh, on the digital reassembling of the collection to enable wide community, um, public and museum engagement with the new knowledge produced and um, shared curatorial and ethnographic authority. Uh, the digital platform will unify this dispersed collection, linking it digitally across departments in the museums and across museums um, and semantic web and tagging will build relationships between objects, archives, images, stories and country. And it will incorporate Manane Cartagen, past and present um, of the species represented in the collection, seasonal patterns of fishing, techniques and technologies, effects of climate change on species movement and availability. And the collection also consists of beautiful artwork by Neil. In addition to the fish sketches, um, Neil sketched Menang people, their country and ceremonies. And prior to his position in the commissariat in Albany, he worked in Tasmania where he also sketched and painted. He collected botanical specimens and also painted Indigenous people. He knew William Bulu Gould, who's a convict artist who painted the exquisite Book of Fishes, um, which has been made famous by Richard Flanagan's Book of Fish. And we've invited Palawa artist and curator, Dr. Julie Goff, to take part in an artist in residency program. So Goff will respond to the art in the collection. So I really feel this is a very unique collection with huge potential for Manang family knowledge, as well as critical historical and scientific understanding of cross-cultural encounters and fish habits and habitats across diverse epistemologies. And the collection was made uh, because of Neil's curiosity in Menang life, but was also enabled by Menang generosity in sharing knowledge, stories and food. And that can be seen here, I think, in this slide. Um, you can, this is uh, Neil's, um, an article about Neil. He returned to Edinburgh in 1848 and he took with him a live kilong or live tortoise, which he had um, tasted, um, he tasted other, um, specimens of this tortoise by sitting at Menang campfires and they showed him how to eat it. And there's a nice connection between um, contemporary Nunga artist Leonard Thorne, who has painted this beautiful picture of the tortoise and described how Nunga people know where to find the eggs of the of the tortoise. 
and and you can see that connection across time. Um, I think it shows a continuation of knowledge and knowledge which Neil uh, experienced in the 19, uh, 1840s as well. Thanks, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was just such a be beautiful overview and really interesting that you're kind of resisting the notion of decolonization as perhaps, you know, not possible in the colonial context of a museum, but yeah, moving towards reculturing. Re um, maybe that's another version of, of denaturalizing. Anyway, really great ideas that we, I'm sure we can pick up in the discussion. So, Shino, can you tell us some things? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, <laughs> I will just start my PowerPoint. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, and I will be picking up on the theme of decolonizing. Um, so it should make for an interesting discussion <clears throat> um, at the end. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the um, Wajak Noongar on whose Buja um, here in Perth. Um, I'm privileged to live and work. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so my talk is called Decolonising uh, Natural History Collections and Indigenous Intermediaries. And I sort of, partly this is a riff off um, sort of recent reports in British newspapers. So earlier this week, um, it was reported that engineering students could be taught, quote, how Sir Isaac Newton benefited from colonialism um, because of his shares in, uh, in a company that traded in slaves, end quote. Um, so this was revealed in a leaked draft plan to decolonise the science curriculum at Sheffield University. This news sparked readers' outrage against the so-called woke idiocy common in many universities today, end quote, and very few online commentators were sympathetic to the university's rationale for decolonising the curriculum, which was to incorporate historically marginalised or suppressed knowledge in all disciplines so that all of our students have the opportunity to see themselves reflected in what they're being taught, end quote. This recent push to decolonise universities stems from 2015 student protests in South Africa, and as Tiffany mentioned, the broader Black Lives Matter movement, which has led some large institutions in Britain and elsewhere to begin reevaluating their histories, especially their connections to slavery. Calls to decolonize the humanities and social sciences are now decades old. Anthropology in particular was subject to intense indigenous criticism in the 1980s. And this and other disciplines have, taken, uh, have since taken significant steps, though I guess to many um, are not quite there yet. However, while there's been similar calls in the sciences since the turn of the, of the millennium at least, reforms seem to have been made at a much slower pace, um, as Tiffany mentioned in regard to um, science and natural history museums compared to other museums. In 2020, a working group at the University of Sheffield's Department of Animal and Plant Sciences, or APS, published a guide explaining why decolonizing the sciences is imperative. They say Western universities act as gatekeepers that determine what and whose knowledge, history, and intellectual contribution is valuable. This allows them to perpetuate the hegemony of European ways of knowing and seeing the world and erasing, suppressing, or ignoring other perspectives. So by seeking to explore Menang ways of knowing, um, this project can contribute to this decolonizing, um, or to this endeavor to decolonize natural history collecting practices and collections. Following on from Tiffany's paper, I'll outline how I'll attempt to decolonize Neil's archive by focusing on the history of the Menang individuals who played key roles in collecting specimens and informing the British about the fish and other local fauna in the mid 19th century. These figures can be seen as indigenous intermediaries or go-betweens, individuals who mediated relations between so-called natives and newcomers, recovering their complex histories and contributions to the early scientific knowledge about Australia entails adopting two decolonizing approaches. So the first is 
highlighting the colonial processes which determine how Indigenous intermediaries and their labour and knowledge were perceived, treated and represented. And secondly, by drawing on Indigenous knowledge to better understand these individuals um, you know, and their motives for engaging with the colonists um, and endeavouring to produce new research about them that is meaningful and of value to the Nene people. As we've not yet begun this project, my talk today will just um, try to sort of map out some of the relevant scholarship and methodological issues needed um, to examine the Menang intermediaries, focusing mainly on that first um, approach I mentioned of highlighting the colonial processes embedded in these early um, archives. Um, I'll illustrate these through examples of other Indigenous intermediaries who contributed um, to other exploration expeditions elsewhere in Australia, as well as some speculative interpretations or preliminary readings of Neil, of Robert Neil's um, accounts of the Menang intermediaries and their knowledge. Um, and I guess I should um, say that this is uh, primarily just a reading of a letter that he wrote to the British Museum um, that was then published in Edward Eyre's 1845 journal. So the first, um, the first part of my talk um, focuses on decolonising the life sciences. So the aforementioned Sheffield APS Working Group proposes that decolonising the sciences would entail four general approaches. And they outline these as one, confronting the historical roles of European science in racism and the injustices of colonisation. Um, two, acknowledging that the science we teach is white and takes a Eurocentric viewpoint. So these are all quotes, by the way. Um, and I would interpret that, um, you know, sorry, this approach is, um, is by um, acknowledging that um, there are narrow definitions of what constitutes science um, and sciences often omit, omit discussions of non-white scientists and do not address the um, power relations between the global south and the north. Um, their third approach is to quote, diversifying the perspectives taught and valuing the perspectives and worldviews that minorities and non-Westerners bring to science, um, end quote. So drawing on Leila Marcel, um, I'd say this could be achieved through the inclusion of Indigenous science, defined as um, relating to both the science knowledge of long resident, usually oral, people, oral culture peoples, as well as science knowledge of all peoples who as participants in culture are affected by the worldview and relative interests of their home communities. And finally, four, empowering students and staff to understand their own positionality. So more specifically, the APS Working Group prescribes that the history, philosophy and ethics of science acknowledge that science is not truly objective and recognise the problematic aspects in their histories of different scientific fields, including science's contribution to racial discourses and racism and the racist views of some of, some of its celebrated figures, as well as the colonial roots of collecting practices and key institutions. Um, they warn that we do not just need to be cognizant of this history, but that we also acknowledge that researchers accrue benefits from this colonial past when using the collections today. Um, so I guess this is a way of addressing um, objections that, you know, this has all happened in the past, so it doesn't affect us today. So they, they want to draw that link out from the past and the present. Um, further, the working group recommends that diversity in epistemology be valued, since Western scientific perspectives are just one of many different ways of understanding the world, and that we can learn much from engaging with Indigenous knowledges. Finally, they advocate cross-disciplinary research, stressing the importance of social sciences, and I would add humanities, to understanding the wider world, political and cultural implications, um, sorry, the wider social, political and cultural implications of biological science research. So our project pursues this, decol well, I think our project should pursue this decolonizing agenda um, and method in at least two broad ways. The first is by critically engaging with the colonial processes inherent in the production of Neil's archive, that is his correspondence, records, illustrations and specimens, as well as the Museum of Edinburgh's result, resultant collection. We can consider the interpersonal power dynamics between the British and the Menang, the ideas informing British perceptions of and attitudes towards the Menang, and the appropriation of Indigenous knowledge. 
we'll be attentive to how these processes were enacted both in the field. Um, so, you know, in Kinjaling, meaning place of plenty, the Manang name for Albany, um, and in the Imperial Centre, whereas Raylan Con Connell reminds us, information from across the colonised world was sent, processed, and then assembled into um, the disciplines we know, usually in a kind of a D, um, or in a, in a way that um, had removed that colonial context. The second way our project can pursue a decolonizing agenda is by valuing Noongar Kartagen um, and recognizing that this knowledge has been developed empirically through observation and experimentation to use natural resources in sustainable ways and deal with the challenges posed by changing environments and climates over millennia. We can also adopt what Botswana and um, post-colonial scholar Bagale Chilisa calls respectful representations that is by creating space for the voices and knowledges of Manang knowledge holders, both historical and contemporary, um, whose local knowledge of their country's environments and ecologies, as well as Manang resource management practices, Noongar language skills and oral traditions can offer new perspectives and insights on the collection and enrich our research. Our project is also built on reciprocal appropriation. Um, by ensuring that the benefits of knowledge produced um, and transmitted is shared and valued by the Manang investigators and community, as well as by our cross-disciplinary research team. So I'll now discuss um, how I can specifically contribute to the project um, through this focus on the intermediaries. I'll outline some of the historiography in my own research um, on or my own previous research. Um, to show how it can continue, how it can provide clues to unpacking the colonial processes which imbue and shape the representation of these figures. Um, so I'm going to move on to that. Exploration was the foundational subject for Australian history as it marked the beginning of Australia's European origins and narrated Anglo-Australia's first steps towards opening up and seemingly domesticating the continent. From the 19th century and well into the 20th, histories presented this as a largely white story with Aboriginal people rarely included or portrayed as ignorant savages. Henry Reynolds' 1990 book with the white people marked a significant turning point, illuminating the unspoken Indigenous contribution to the history of Australian exploration. He focuses on the numerous Aboriginal guides who contributed to overland expeditions, providing local knowledge and bushcraft, as the expeditions travel through country, acting as ambassadors and envoys to the traditional owners of new territories entered, and serving as private assistants to not only explorers, but also to many colonists and travellers venturing into the bush to collect natural history specimens. His aim was to include these valiant, these quote, valiant heroes um, in the history of exploration. Since that time, scholars in Australia and overseas have sought to uncover similar hidden histories of Indigenous intermediaries and scientific exploration, but in ways that are more attentive to the difficulties in recovering and interpreting this history. And the need to reframe our understanding of the imperial collections amassed by scientific expeditions in European colonies by uncovering and highlighting the role of Indigenous intermediaries and knowledge. These intermediaries' history was not just hidden because it was overlooked by historians, it was often deliberately effaced in European accounts of heroic exploration. As D. Graham Burnett explains, uncovering the role of Indigenous intermediary figures requires reading European texts against the grain, paying attention to not just what is recorded, but what is left unstated. For example, Catherine Fritsch and Burnett, in their respective studies of German explorers in Africa, in Africa um, and British explorers in British Guiana, they observed that many explicitly claim that many explorers had explicitly claimed to travel alone, uh, despite the fact that they were usually dependent on the native guides, porters, and translators recruited upon arriving at key ports, or depicting themselves as intrepidly leading the expedition when it's more likely, um, in regard to the British Guiana um, case, uh, that the explorers had simply joined um, regular seasonal Amerindian journeys. Um, and so, you know, the subject to following them as opposed to leading an exploration, um, which is how they presented it. So I think this tendency to kind of self heroize is also in, evident in, um, in Neil's letter. Um, 
In it, he asserts that, you know, I set off in my little skiff to catch the fish and then um, make drawings of all of these when I come home tired in the evening. Uh, yet in the counts, and um, as Tiffany illustrated, many, um, sorry, yet other accounts um, describe many instances of Menin catching and spearing fish um, to give to the British. And as Tiffany showed, there are spear holes, um, so revealing that they were caught by Aboriginal people. And so I guess what I'm interested in here is thinking about that this letter, which is then published, um, so it kind of represents the public face of his archive, you know, or the public 19th century face of the archive, as opposed to his personal correspondence um, that's unpublished, in that it sort of positions him as the sort of sole figure um, doing this, and it um, kind of omits um, the Indigenous contribution. Moving on, sort of, I guess, more generally, um, we see if Indigenous intermediaries were mentioned, their contribution was minimised by them being portrayed as mere, servant, mere servants, as Fritch notes, or in the Australian case, as D Dane Kennedy explains, um, often referred to simply as boys. Um, so while a significant number of um, Aboriginal um, guides and intermediaries were actually boys, um, such as Kudachar and Narambaran, who were about eight and ten years old, um, when Edward Eyre recruited them on his overlanding expeditions. Um, many Aboriginal men were also referred to as boys in order to reflect and bolster a colonial power dynamic. This tendency to diminish the intermediary's role is apparent in the Australian accounts. Francis Borelier, who was commissioned by Governor King to find a route across the Blue Mountains in 1802, enlisted Darawal man Gogi as his guide, and at times presented him as a mere servant in two ways. Firstly, um, he explicitly refers to him as, quote, the native I have in my service, uh, end quote. But also more implicitly, he refrains from naming Gogi as a source of information um, about the local environments that he describes. And I'll come back to this point. Um, yet when he, he doesn't name Gogi as a source for his information, yet he frequently will kind of, or, or yet at times, sorry, he... Um, reports his explicit or orders to Gogi um, to perform menial tasks. So, so, quote, I made Gogi cut a hut for me and I had it placed on the slope of a hill whence I could enjoy a view of the ponds, end quote. Um, so what we get in these accounts is um, descriptions of what has to be Indigenous informed knowledge, um, yet that's not attributed. And what we do have, see is explicitly um, the explicit accounts of the guides tends to be these, um, you know, orders and directives which uh, minimise their um, status and contribution. Air also does this, um, frequently describing his orders um, to um, his intermediaries to fetch water, prepare the camp, tend to animals, track down horses and stock, etc. So Bennett argues that colonial tech, and so this contributes to erasing the um, kind of uh, intellectual contribution they make to actually um, conducting these surveys and explorations. Bennett argues that colonial textual practices also typically obscured the fragility of the European explorer and their immense dependence on Indigenous intermediaries by in turn depicting the natives as fragile, um, so quote natives, as fragile, immature, ignorant, and in need of European civilization. This is evident in Borelier's dis disparaging description of Gogi as useless, um, an evaluation uncritically shared by recent historians who blame Gogi for the expedition's failure. Air similarly presents his intermediaries as helpless, um, and you know, I would argue to mask his own anxiety about them leaving the expedition, um, which is a sort of you know, an unsaid acknowledgement that he couldn't do it. The, his expedition without them. He reports that um, um, two of them, Narambaran and the young Menang man Wiley, um, who had quit the expedition, were forced to return um, because according to him, or according to Air, they could get nothing to eat for themselves. Um, or, you know, this is what Wiley apparently said. But this claim is questionable given that one of their duties on the expedition was to hunt for game. And the reason that they had left um, the expedition was tensions caused by um, its growing food crisis. 
So Eyre fails to consider that they may have returned to be with Kudicha, the youngest boy whom Eyre had physically restrained and prevented from departing with them. So soon after their return, the three intermediaries um, planned another um, unfortunate or made another sort of unfortunately ill-fated um, plan to escape. A similar tendency is evident in Neil's letter in which he represents um, Tultuoli, one of his main Menean intermediaries, uh, in the most disparaging terms, as naive in order to indirectly boast about the fidelity of his own drawing. So again, this is in his letter um, to the British Museum. Neil's method was to, um, you know, in, in making his drawings, was to first draw the fish on any paper he could find, but then cut that picture out and paste it onto a clean sheet. Tultawali, he says, described, uh, who, who he described as one of the oldest and most friendly savages we have of the King George tribe, um, had apparently, quote, observed that the drawings were a little raised off the paper. And according to Neil, quote, like a monkey, began to touch them with his long talons, um, marvelling that Neil appeared to have pasted the actual fish skin on the paper. Um, Neil wrote that he could only correct, quote, the poor savage's mistake um, in quote, by demonstrating his method. Um, it was not just the Indigenous intermediaries themselves who were often effaced in the colonial records. It's also the knowledge they imparted to Europeans. Fritch argues that this was often masked in the resultant geographic studies and maps through ascribing new place names to replace the original Indigenous place names. As Norman Etherington has demonstrated um, in the South African context, this renaming reinforced imperial or colonial fantasies that the territory traversed was simply a wilderness um, to be mapped and eventually domesticated and rendered useful through settlement, agriculture, or pastoralism. And incidentally, the APS Working Group, in their proposal to decolonize the sciences, um, you know, have an extended discussion about you know, why we shouldn't, or you know, the issues with the um, terminology like wilderness. Um, which, you know, erases Indigenous cultural, I mean, you know, sovereignty, but also their cultural um, connections to land. So this erasure was also evident in David Carnegie's account of his exploration through the Western Australian deserts in 1896. Carnegie was notable for forcing Aboriginal people to act as guides by kidnapping them until they led him to water. Um, one man who was chained and force-fed salt beef to make him so thirsty that he would take Carnegie, uh, to make him thirsty, um, he eventually led Carnegie to an underground cave in Nutanjara lands. This was a substantial and no doubt very important water source for the Nutanjara, for it took Carnegie and his men four days to drain all of the water um, from, um, um, you know, to drain all of the water for their own needs. Um, but the cave also contained ritual objects, which were carved boards used for rainmaking ceremonies, and Carnegie lamented that they were too big for him to take with him. Although on his return, um, he, on his return journey, he found similar boards in a nearby cave and stole those to give to Premier John Forrest in an attempt to elicit Forrest as a patron, um, and then other ritual or ceremonial objects um, he took, um, he sent on to the British Museum, where some are still in the collection today. The man told, uh, the kidnapped um, man or in intermediary, told Carnegie that this cave was called um, Maculia Ayatenya, sorry for my pronunciation, um, which, which Carnegie promptly renamed Empress Springs uh, in honour of Queen Victoria and a name that remains today. So Indigenous knowledge about local environments was also appropriated. For example, despite Borrelier's explicit criticism of Gogi, he was undoubtedly crucial to the expedition and Borrelier's surveys. Um, before other Gandangara men, so the Blue Mountains are in Gandangara country, so before other Gandangara men joined the expedition, um, Gogi was the only guide navigating um, the expedition's route and providing local place names and identifying the usual resources that could be hunted or harvested at these locales. For instance, two swamps were called Manangal and Karabili, um, and Borrelier describes how these teemed with eels, fish, and various species, um, which were used by the natives as food. He also provided detailed descriptions of the local Dharawal and Gandangara method for hunting kangaroo, 
which entailed working together to form an enormous circle that enclosed an area of approximately two miles um, and then slowly um, moving forward or to enclose the kangaroo within um, their kind of human net. Yet Borrelio never explicitly attributes this information to Gogi. He simply states it. Um, it's sort of, you know, always passively stated. Um, so reading against the grain, we can deduce that it was Gogi's knowledge because he was the only Aboriginal person on the expedition at this point, and they had travelled through um, territory, which was at that time um, uncharted by the British. Gogi also acted as a diplomat. Um, so on one occasion, we see that, you know, in, in um, negotiating with Gundungara people on Borrelia's behalf, or with some of them, um, and he managed to obtain an important specimen for Borrelia from a group of Gundungara people they met. And this was two feet belonging to an animal called the Kolo, um, which, and Gogi did this because he assumed Borrelia would be interested in um, these after noticing that Borrelia, you know, was keen on collect collecting animal specimens. Um, and indeed, Gogi kind of independently went out and collected a range of other um, specimens for um, Borrelia to a very kind of mixed um, response to Borrelia. Um, so in, in independently um, obtaining these uh, colo feet, Gogi actually had to exchange two spears and a tomahawk that he'd made for himself. And intrigued by what he believed were monkey paws, Borrelia preserved these um, two feet in spirits. And in order to ingratiate himself with his own patron, he sent them to Governor King and Governor King in turn sent them on to Joseph Banks in Britain. So these colo feet were in fact koala feet. Um, and this was the earliest specimen of the animal known to the colonists. Um, the first live um, koala that the British had seen um, was the following year. And again, that was when Aboriginal people actually brought a live one into the Port Jackson settlement. So Gogi's role in the discovery of the koala um, was, you know, until recently, until recently relatively little known, um, whereas Borrelia's name is more often attached to this story. Neil also obfuscates the role of individual Indigenous intermediaries in his letter, providing a significant degree of information about the fish, which obviously stemmed from the Ning knowledge, but not attributing this to Indigenous or to individual informants. He details the Menang Nungar names for particular fish and notably distinguishes um, between the seemingly more generic names used by the young men or the young Menang and the more specialised name used by the elders, um, resulting, as Tiffany explained, or, or, you know, revealing how the kind of Menang taxonomy works. He also reports, so he reports that in naming their animals, the old men are more minute in species. Um, the younger often call very different fish by the same name. Um, so I guess indicating a more generic term fish as opposed to the particular um, species. He also describes various properties about the fish and reptiles, for instance, about snake, um, you know, telling them about snake venom and how to treat it or how long its effects last. Um, and so he does say that, you know, this is what the natives say, but again, it's sort of not attributed to individuals. It's only Tultawali, um, who in the aforementioned anecdote about the drawings is mentioned as, quote, assisting me in naming them. Um, yeah, as we embark on the project um, and delve further into um, Neil's notes, as Tiffany's already um, done or started to do, the names of other Menang intermediaries and specific fish and the specific fish specimens they caught can be recovered and contextualised and their contribution to this history recognised. Um, so now I will um, conclude. Um, so this project offers a, a very exciting opportunity, um, I think, to decolonising how we look at collections um, and how we, how we look at this early collecting um, practices, um, which in turn can help us to kind of decolonise the life sciences and history and decolonizing doesn't have to mean criticizing or being anti-colonial or, or sorry, doesn't mean um, necessarily you know, seeing these institutions um, 
in negative terms, but I think it's enriching them to kind of open up and provide different um, different contexts and knowledge systems that, um, as I said, in, enrich our understanding of these collections. Um, and you know, hopefully we can do this by uncovering the contributions of, of individual Manang intermediaries who played key roles in the collection and interpretation um, of the fish collection um, and reveal the um, value of Indigenous knowledge and science. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, you know, that was amazing, amazing journey into these um, encounters um, and really, um, yeah, recontextualising where these specimens and this, this knowledge comes from. And um, so do people do um, start to put some questions in or uh, you can also raise your hand um, and we will... Um, get you to ask your question but I've got one to get us started while people are you know warming up and uh processing so there seems to be to get back to this question of decolonization um there seems to be maybe two aspects this is just like a a, a question or a, a statement to respond to so on the one hand there is the exposing of colonial exploitation that goes into these um that goes into these collections, like literally and historically. And I think your example to start with, you know, of, you know, Newton benefiting from the slave trade and that being seen as like, you can't say that, that's shocking or that's irrelevant. Um, now that's all part of, yeah, exposing the colonial roots um, and then kind of plus minus redressing those things. And maybe that's where some of Tiffany's dis disconcerting, disconcertment comes in that, you know, can we actually redress these things? So there's the kind of that side of it. And then on the other side, there is the um, reconstitution of Indigenous knowledges, whether that is about the intermediaries or what we probably would call co-researchers these days, like how these things were actually um, just, you know, how they were recorded and, and known, um, all the Tiffany's work on looking at, you know, the names and uses and um, textual um traces so yeah are those are those two different things or are they the same thing what what do you think do you want to um we can you can respond if you want you know and i can respond after you um well i think that um i, I mean I, I think they are different things but what i think is that they're different stages of i think the same process mm -hmm. um so I think that, you know, I mean, part of the sort of broader, um, you know, the broader literature and, and, and processes of, of um, decolonising is first sort of exposing and coming to terms um, with, um, I guess, historic injustices and, and thinking through their implications. Um, and so I think the first stage is a kind of activist um, stage to kind of, you know, shock and awaken, um, uh, I guess, a dominant culture that is either, you know, oblivious or in denial. Um, and so I suppose like you know, with the statues and, and the, the Black Lives Movement, we're sort of in that phase. Um, but I guess specifically um, for, for looking at this collection, I, I think, you know, we sort of have to um, unpack um, the, 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 the sort of the colonial discourses within um, these early accounts um, and to, you know, so that includes the kind of, you know, um, the language and, um, you know, a range of other factors and including how collections were made. Um, so, um, so, you know, some seems to be kind of um, collaborative. I mean, I think Gogi was trying to kind of ingratiate himself to Borelier and so he was giving or you know he seemed to be of his own initiative giving um, things to or giving specimens to um, Borelier but at the same time he also realized he was like he had the protection of Borelier and um, his marines um, and 
Um, whereas Carnegie's at the other end of the spectrum in that he is using physical force and violence to force Indigenous people to um, give up their knowledge. Um, and he's also stealing collection or stealing ritual items that then, um, you know, are still make their way again through attempts to elicit, um, you know, relation or patron relationships to service his own career. Um, and, you know, and those, those um, items remain. So I, I think it's important to kind of identify these colonial processes inherent in the accounts and the collections. Um, and then I think once you sort of do that, then we can start and, and you know, I, I think it is absolutely crucial um, to then start to sort of, you know, add in, you know, what, what, what's important for Indigenous communities. So it's, it's knowing, well, how can we recover insights of Indigenous agency about, you know, ancestors? Um, how can we recover Indigenous knowledge and practices? How can we recognise the kind of longer roots in, in what we do today or our cultural practices today? Um, you know, um, sorry, the, the sort of historic roots of, of practices today or how it's changed um, since then. Um, and, and, you know, I think that these kinds of idea, you know, that these kinds of processes are also really important. Um, sorry, I'll just quickly jump to another example in this kind of recent discussions about decolonizing. And they say it's imperative that those, you know, those first stages of decolonizing tend to talk about, um, you know, black victimhood. Um, so again, this is in the sort of British context, um, you know, by looking at slavery, but nothing else. So that leaves marginalised students as feeling, you know, that they only have a negative history. So I think adding in this more positive, celebratory, kind of productive um, ideas that Indigenous people can use to understand their own pasts, um, you know, that's vital. But I think it has to be done as part and parcel of also acknowledging um, those colonial processes. Um, yeah, I think it would be hard to just jump straight to that point without realising how Indigenous knowledge was actually obfuscated or erased um, in the first place. Sorry, very long, convoluted response. Well, that's great, Tina. Now, I would just add um, to that very briefly that I think, yeah, I think the idea of stages is really um, a very clear way of, of, of exploring that. And I think because, in a sense, um, you know, colonialism around this kind of knowledge um, taking or recording did also occur in stages and we can see the ways in which museums also um, often um, um, were part of that staged process as well. Different kinds of layers of knowledge were revealed or, or not questioned in the cataloguing and, and um, databasing of various collections as well. And I'll just say that the, the final kind of part of our project will also be um, having a um, decolonizing uh, workshop in the Natural History Museum with the archivist and Miranda Lowe, who's in life sciences um, with the elders. So that was Miranda Lowe's idea. And I wonder how that will play out. It'll be really interesting to see how, how that works and what, what, yeah, what we kind of make of that at the end. Yeah, because I, I wonder if there is a shift going on. This is again, a, a statement slash question where rather than seeing uh, things as a zero sum game, so if, if things are being decolonized, you know, scientists don't have access to them anymore, someone else is taking them. And that of course assumes that indigenous people and scientists are mutually exclusive, which of course they're not, but there is this sense that the scientific, um, scientific accounts can only um, be harmed from indigenous knowledge. Um, and I think that relates to, you know, I mean, what you were talking about, you know, so many examples of what we call the possessive investment in whiteness, which um, uh, Aileen Morton Robinson has really uh, explored a lot in relation to Australia and this incredible insecurity about the fact that they are stealing all this knowledge. And I don't know, of course, that's maybe historically uh, shaky to make that kind of claim about the um, mental state of, of um these uh, collectors, but you know, I'm an anthropologist, so I can I can go out and do that. Um, but I think things might be changing where, um, you know, with ecological approaches, um, scientists actually want to be able to uh, understand the indigenous knowledge. And um, is that is that the case? 
Yeah, I, I think so. Which, you know, what do you think? I think that's definitely, I mean, I think the scientists who were um, invited to be part of the team are so excited about the what they can learn um, about their own collections in their museums, both in, both in the WA Museum and in the National Museum in Scotland. Um, these are, I mean, the, the WA Museum curator, Glenn Moore has done a lot of work with Indigenous communities, but Andrew Kitchener in Edinburgh has never had that opportunity and is really excited. So I think it's sort of, yeah, really keen and eager to learn from, from Manang. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree too. I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, you know, I guess it's all, it, it, I mean, you know, it's all on an individual basis, but I, I think that, um, um, you know, there are definitely, you know, moves to, and, and there's a lot of literature, you know, calling for um, collaborations with, and, and ways to incorporate Indigenous knowledge. Um, I mean, the CSIRO has quite, you know, a, a, a detailed web page about um, Indigenous knowledge and, or, or Aboriginal science, as they call it, and kind of, um, you know, ways that they can address it. So I, I think, you know, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, moves to, to be, um, you know, to work collaboratively. And I think a lot of Indigenous communities recognise that they can benefit um, from it as well by, you know, having these sort of broader understandings of um, their environment. Um, I mean, sort of interesting, there was a couple of years ago, um, the, the State Library of Western Australia had an exhibition um, which included um, David Carnegie's Desert Expedition. And um, so one of their programs was to follow Carnegie's route through the desert and talk to all those communities. And their aim was to get, um, you know, was to, to work with communities, read through Carnegie's accounts um, and see the ways in which his, his journal is like mapping up with oral histories. Um, and for most, a lot of the people they talked to, um, their interest wasn't in his ill treatment or, I mean, you know, the, the kind of terrible, um, you know, his terrible treatment of, of Aboriginal people he kidnapped along the way. Um, but what they were interested in was the accounts of the, you know, botanical species and, and how the kind of environmental um, descriptions in his journal kind of matched up with their own with their own knowledge and also using this through their discussion you know through bringing elders together who are getting to talk about it um, you know which is was helping the journal was helping them to kind of um, talk through memories of you know engaging with these plants and, and species that um, Carnegie describes so um, so, you know, I, I think it, you know, it's really important to understand how Carnegie treated Indigenous people, especially if you're reading these, you know, at times horrific accounts. But at the same time, I think Indigenous communities can see other values. And so they don't want to just dismiss it, um, but they can see other values and information that is, you know, um, important to them. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, reminder that uh, we don't want to kind of repeat or, you know, reiterate the mistake of not seeing any value in Indigenous accounts by just thinking that Indigenous, that colonial accounts are just completely useless or completely, you know, yeah, poisoned in a way by their production, that there are all sorts of uses that they might be put to. And also interesting that, yeah, CSIRO and, I mean, Australia is really, um, and other uh, settler colonies are really doing a lot better, I think, with decolonising science, and we're kind of colonising our decolonialism into Europe. So there you go. Um, so we have a question um, from Jeff Craig. Do you want to um, talk, Jeff? Ask. Sure, sure. Um, thanks to both speakers. Some very interesting, very interesting story, detective stories. Um, I've heard this before. I've heard criticism of the word discovered before because it's, it's, a, re, it's a rediscovery. When, when, when colonists identified species and wrote them down, these were, had been known to Indigenous peoples for, for millennia. Should we tread carefully when using, when using this term? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, absolutely. I and mean, I realised that I talked about my own discovery in the archive. <laughs> that was obviously not the case either, but that those objects were there um, and had been, you know, worked on and, 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 and set up by archivists and curators. But yes, I think that word discovered is definitely, um, you know, in, in quote marks, because um, I think it, you know, it's, it's unspoken but clear in, in the um, collection by the uh, use of indigenous names for the fish, which these some of the fishermen who caught the fish um, didn't know, had didn't have names for them, but obviously the name names were included and recorded. And, and even in the case of the parallel fish being included as the Manang name in the scientific um, taxonomic process in 1845. So there is all these suggestions, of course, throughout the collection that this, this were, these fish were known prior to um, European discovery that was, were totally discounted in the Linnaean classification systems um, that were put to it. I'll just try and be really quick to add. Um, yeah, I mean, like Tiffany, I use the term discovered in a, you know, un, un, unthinking way um, and should try to be more conscious of it. Um, but I just want to quickly say that, um, you know, the APS working um, group, they discuss this in relation to um, natural sciences and say that, um, you know, that there's still a, a tendency, um, you know, new, new species are so-called being discovered all the time. And so, you know, they, they um, warn that um, as this happens that, um, you know, botanists and other scientists should be aware of that and um, sort of, yeah, recognise that it's only um, the discovery to, or it's only new to um, sort of Western science and think about other um, Indigenous knowledge formations which may have already um, been aware of these. So, um, which, you know, is something I had never thought about. You know, I kind of always think about discovery in terms of a historic period, um, but not, you know, as I'm not a scientist, I don't think about kind of ongoing um, or, or current new discoveries. So. Mm. It was an interesting point to read. Thanks, and and with Tiffany mentioned, you mentioned about the Linnaean system. I, I really get frustrated sometimes when, when I I like to um, take photographs of, of the natural world, and I go on join Facebook groups and people ID stuff, and they always give me the Latin name. I'm thinking, give me the common name. You know, give the common names are much more expressive. And of course, if you know Latin, they're expressive as well. But why not actually have the three names have, or there's not just three, but a, but a traditional name, um, the, the Linnaean name um, and, uh, and the common name. Of course, throughout the world, there are different names for the same fungi, the same fish, the same flowers and flowers and trees. And I've noticed, I'd say certainly for place, for, for place names, and um, New Zealand seems to be doing uh, and other names New Zealand is doing really well at actually calling things by a number of names and so wouldn't it be great if if you have you know you go to a museum you go to a um, you know, a nature trail and it does give you two or three names it did acknowledge all the sources of the names yeah, I agree. That would be really great. Um, there is there is lots of dual naming happening in Western Australia at the moment, yeah. particularly in around Albany, this region. Um, but but I think leaving out most of the common names um, or yeah. So but the interesting the Neil collection on the sketches he does include the the sealers and yeah. the settlers name for the fish as well, um, which is yeah very interesting I think. But probably not unusual for that time to include common names mm. when yeah in recording those kinds of um, collections. Uh, but yes, I think having all the names there um, to really acknowledge all that diversity of knowledge is would be great. Thanks. Okay, so I I think we are. Oh, Tim has a question. Um, Tim. I was just going to take the opportunity to say thank you um, very much to our speakers. I guess uh, uh, this isn't a, a topic I know a huge uh, amount about, but um, as a as a museum visitor, I feel like the the trend has very much become to kind of let objects speak without tags, you know, to present objects with fewer and fewer kind of 
um, surroundings. And I guess I'm I'm interested in how the kinds of things that you're you're researching and thinking about how we might bring those to bear in an actual museum space, or if there are examples that you know you think do a good job of this of trying to reiterate these objects because it feels like in a lot of cases museums are trying to make as much space for interpretation as possible and sometimes that means taking some of that history or even guidance out yeah it's a good question i mean i really have no idea how that would look in a museum context today i just went and saw the new museum in wa last week and um they have got very little text on a lot of their objects but they have a digital platform which kind of gives much broader sort of stories behind if you want to explore more. Um, so it'll be interesting to know how many people actually use that digital platform to explore further and yeah, without the, with that, with very few uh, words on the actual um, displays. Um, we hadn't really thought about a physical exhibition at this stage, but um, it's a possible perhaps in the future that that could happen. Our focus is a digital platform and which has, a, I guess, yeah, I mean, I'm not a curator, I haven't got that experience, but thinking about the layering of knowledge, there's some really great examples from um, an Inuit co collaboration uh, who works on, the, I think it's the McFarlane collection, and, um, they've, and it's also dispersed and they've brought it together in this digital platform, which has a real focus on Inuit uh, interpretation and and knowledge, um, but with also with scientists as well. So I'm, I think I'll be um, just you know borrowing ideas from everywhere and thinking about that. But I don't know, Sheena, you might have some better ideas than me. I think it is really hard to to um, yeah to, yeah to find that balance of, of of information, just enough information to kind of be enough, but not not too heavy. Um, yeah, I don't really have any um, solutions or suggestions to offer of it. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, I guess sort of supplementary platforms is, um, you know, is really useful, um, I guess, to cater to different audiences and, and, and having it available <clears throat> might intrigue those who, um, who, you know, who initially may not be interested, but may become interested and then, you know, slowly, um, um, I guess, become more appreciative of, of what um, this kind of indi Indigenous knowledge context and, and historical context can kind of um, assist their own understanding. So, um, so yeah, I guess those sort of additional platforms sound, sound really good. And, um, yeah. I've just got a, a provocative question maybe to end on. Um, so, the, so as I understand it, um, Tiffany, you know, some of the specimens um, and, and beautiful drawings and so on are of uh, species that are extinct, that are no longer? We're not absolutely sure. So that will have to be determined by the ichthyologist who has to identify the specimens. There was some um, discussion in our first meeting that that might be the case, but he's since... Um, unsure so right. that, yeah not, not yet to be determined yeah so I suppose mm -hmm. then the question is like uh, once these um, once these specimens and knowledge have been recultured in the way that you were referring to earlier Tiffany you know what what next is this used in um, conservation efforts um, is this used uh, to um, allow uh, Noongar people to be um, using to, to be hunting and fishing um, or using um, animals in other ways um, and even if they if they are extinct you know would there be any interest in um, using technologies to to you know reanimate these species yeah it's a good question I don't know if I can answer that yet we haven't even begun <laughs> so it feels a bit early um, but I think uh, yeah, for me, I get a sense that there's so many possibilities out of this one fairly specific collection. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just have to see how we go and what the possibilities are. The Menang are certainly keen to relearn some of those practices, um, particularly around the fish um, cleaning with the sand, um, that process. So there's already talk about 
about who gets to go out and do that and what yeah what kind of um yeah meetings will be around that stuff so I think it will be very exciting Okay, well, look, thank you so much to uh, Tiffany Shellam and Shino Kanishi for your time for this uh, really fascinating discussion um, on bringing um, Indigenous Manang knowledge um, into the museum. And uh, it's, it's uh, really heartening that so many um, museum professionals and scientists are um, you know, going along uh, this journey. With the Menang elders. So um, with this we uh, conclude not only this particular session on uh, biocultural collections but also the Emerging Issues in Science and Society series for this year. Uh, Tim did you want to um, close us off? Just by saying thank you to our panelists today uh and uh, in this session and in uh, all our other sessions so thank you obviously uh tiffany and shino and emma for chairing and this morning uh catherine bennett uh john matthewson and our very own jeff craig uh for chairing um member people can um catch up with uh the other sessions by going to our youtube channel uh, just go youtube.com and search for Science and Society Network. All of our old seminars are there. This event will be there. Um, you know, I should say, you know, like and subscribe and all of those kinds of things. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We really, uh, really appreciate it. And um, hope that it's been, yeah, uh, engaging and, and uh, edifying.